when you think about it, most everybody, in our country at least, is dependent upon either the huge corporations and groceries and restaurants for a basic necessity of life. And that's not very smart. For thousands of years, um, reasonable people have all known that they needed to have a way to grow and preserve food so that they could feed their own family all year long. And often other people too, because many times people have others that are dependent on them. The Ready Light into the country. Hi, I'm Lisa Meisner. And I'm Nick, her husband. Welcome back to the Ready Life podcast, where we show you how to make your home and family as independent as possible for things like your water, power, heat, and food. That's right. You know, I was thinking about back in March of 2020, we were visiting family down in Southern California for several weeks. Our kids were getting old enough that we needed to waterproof them where they'd be (laughs) safe in the water. And they were getting to that age. And we had heard about this uh, ISR, uh, Infant Swimming Resource Program, and there was an instructor down there. uh, And it was a, a great experience. But anyhow, we were down there. And for several weeks, we had to be there for those lessons. And while we were there, uh, this thing called COVID started being talked about everywhere in the media. And as we sensed the tensions escalating, we were getting kind of mildly concerned, but it really hit home for us when we'd go to the grocery store and we'd watch the aisles becoming more and more bare. And here we were, far from home, with no pantry, no independent power system, no independent water system, no independent heat, none of this. And to be honest, we were afraid that other states were going to shut down their borders to stop the flow of people heading out of California. And I can think of few places that I'd rather not be during a disaster. Sorry for those of you from California, that's just my opinion. But um, it was a really helpless feeling, and it helped us to understand what many other folks are experiencing uh, every time a disaster or something like that happens when they're in finding themselves in a very vulnerable position. And so needless to say, we decided to get home while the getting was good. And I must say it was such a relief to get back where we had these independent systems set up and where we could function for some time, even if the grocery shelves were bare or the power was off or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, where we can have our own little grocery store of sorts here at home. And I think of those eerie images of the bare shelves and they kind of just imprinted on my brain. And I don't think I'm ever gonna forget that and that helpless feeling. And I'm hoping that those images are still in your head too, and that they've imprinted on your brain also, and that they can serve all of us well as a impetus to become our own little home grocery. And that's our topic for this episode. That's right. (laughs) And I can't think of anyone better to speak on this issue than my mom, Nancy, Uh, She worked for years to implement a home grocery on their homestead, and she's taught classes on this very topic across the country many, many, many times. So, Mom, welcome to the Ready Life podcast. It's about time we had you on here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. Um, What are some of the reasons, you know, why would you want to go to this effort of becoming your own home grocery? And, you know, we mentioned one with the the whole COVID thing, which emphasizes fragile infrastructure, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, What are some other things, reasons why a person would want to go to the effort of becoming their own home grocery? When you think about it, most everybody in our country, at least, is dependent upon either the huge corporations and groceries and restaurants for a basic necessity of life, and that's not very smart. For thousands of years, um, reasonable people have all known that they needed to have a way to grow and preserve food so that they could feed their own family all year long. 
and often other people too, because many times people have others that are dependent on them. So it's not a very smart thing to be dependent upon someone else, especially an unknown entity, for a basic necessity of life. We've gotten into this situation slowly, but you know the generations that are now living really probably don't even remember uh, a time when they did have to prepare each year to make sure that they were going to have food for the next year. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I mean, how many times through history has food been used to control and manipulate people? Hmm. Well, there's a saying that says, he who controls the food controls the people. And there's other reasons, too, that we would want to have uh, an independent food supply. I'm thinking of power grids going down. Uh, years ago, w when Congressman Roscoe Bartlett was still in Congress, uh, we interviewed him. He had started the EMP Commission in Congress to make people aware of what could happen with an EMP. And uh, we actually showed uh, good portions of that interview on our DVD, Urban Danger, uh, which is on YouTube now and can be seen. He was very adamant about people getting prepared and knowing how to provide for their own family in an independent way. Things like the weather. I mean, there's all kinds of floods and tornadoes and things like that that send, uh, that close down groceries. Um, wars. I'm thinking of a war that's going on right now, and I've been reading where the borders have been closed. The infrastructure has basically been shut down. And uh, people that are living in there that may be innocent people don't have a way to even access the power grid and can't get water and things like that. It's extremely wise to set up a way that you can survive, that you can get your basic necessities of life, of which food is a major one, if everything else is shut down. And the health benefits too, you know, you just think about the, in this age of here in America, big agribusiness and GMOs and all these things that you have no idea what's in your food unless you grew it. And so yet another reason. And so much of the soil that our food is grown is in is nutritionally deplete, which mm -hmm. if you have your own home garden, then you can make sure that your soil is healthy and vibrant and full of all the things that your plants need and not just the things your plants need, but the things that we need also when we, when we consume the food that we um, harvest out of our gardens. Right, which that would be the produce department. That'd be the fresh produce department That's of true. our gro home grocery store. And really when you think about it, that because you know, folks might be thinking, well, when you say home grocery store, what do you mean? Well, <laughs> we're b basically we're trying to replace these various departments in the grocery store that you see that are there. We're you know trying to recreate that to a certain extent in our own home. And having a home grocery is really the ultimate food experience, if you want to think of it that way. It's the ultimate in food preparedness. A lot of people think by buying a bunch of dehydrated food uh, and storing it somewhere in a shed or something that they're prepared. No such way. Um, really, having a home grocery is a wonderful way to live, whether there's a crisis going on or not. And it does start with meal planning as ever, anything else, researching and planning, and uh, really making a list of what your family likes to eat. I. I think maybe like a two-week meal plan list showing what foods your family enjoys eating. You don't want to start eating a lot of things you're not familiar with or don't even like in a time of need or crisis. Have foods that you like, that you know your family will eat. And then take that list, break it down into the ingredients that would go into each item. Let's just say you wanted a spaghetti meal. You'd need pasta, you'd need uh, a pasta sauce, and uh, things that 
would contribute, then you, then you break that down into what are the ingredients that would go into each thing. What, was, what would be in a pasta sauce if you made it uh, from scratch? Could you make pasta at home? You can and things like that. So then you, you make your list, you break it down into the ingredients, and then you take that list of ingredients, uh, such as the pasta sauce. Well, you'd need tomatoes and you'd need onions and garlic and some, uh, whatever else you add in your pasta sauce. What if those things could you grow in your garden? And what things could you produce on your property that you may, maybe didn't grow? Things like, um, Items that needed sweeteners. You can learn beekeeping. You can have produce your own honey. You can get spouts and buckets. And if you have maple trees and actually a number of other kinds of trees, you can have a uh, little maple syrup factory on your property. So there's things you can produce in, a, in addition to things that you grow. But the core of your home grocery is definitely going to be the fresh produce department. And then you need to be able to preserve what you've grown so that you can eat year round from that garden. Otherwise, you're just going to eat during the growing season and that won't get you through the whole year. Yeah, back to that food store or the menu planning, like you mentioned, is kind of where you would start with your food storage program. We actually did a whole episode walking people through how to do that because that might seem overwhelming. If you just think of one jar of um pasta sauce, that's great, but then you're not going to have any more tomatoes out of your garden until next year. And so you want to figure out how much pasta sauce you're going to need for a year uh, to get you through until you harvest your tomatoes from your garden again. So anyway, we went through all of that. We actually put together a food storage planning calculator um, that you can use. And uh, do you remember what podcast that was? Let's see. You did that? You know, I was just looking it up. <laughs> I was thinking I should have looked it up ahead of time. And let's see. It was pretty early on. Number food storage. Number five. So oh, wow. The ready life. That was a little com. while ago. <laughs> yeah. So if you go to the ready life.com forward slash five, the number five, that'll get you to that podcast. And there's also a download there with a calculator that helps you, walks you through how to plan out, you know, what, what mom was talking about with making a two-week menu and then, you know, eating that menu for two weeks and then notating the ingredients that you use. If you plug all of that into the calculator, then it'll spit out for you your totals at the end of that two weeks. And then you can multiply it out and know how much food it takes to feed your family for a given period of time for three months, six months, whatever. And that download you can actually get for free or that spreadsheet calculator you can get for free by going to the readylife.com forward slash food planner. And that's all one word, all lowercase, the readylife.com forward slash food planner. So yeah, that's the foundation to all of this because if you don't know what you need and how much of it you need, you're home grocery store is going to be a disaster. <laughs> so that's step one. So we've planned, we've created our menu. Now we're looking at the various, I guess, departments. We're talking the home grocery. So going along with that allegory, what are the, what are the various departments in our home grocery? I'll grab my cart. Well, let's start moving through. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, as we mentioned, the core of it is going to be your fresh produce department. That's where you're going to have veggies that you've grown in your garden, fruits from your orchard, berries from your berry patches, nuts from the orchard too. Uh, and then you also want to be able to have fresh produce year round. You won't be able to grow all of those things year round that you grow in your summer garden. But there are some things you can grow year round and have fresh uh, in December and January. If you have a hoop house, some people will have a greenhouse, but a hoop house is much less expensive. Um, high tunnels you can use. Uh, you can extend the growing season by having a fall garden and starting really early in the spring, especially with cold frames or uh, things like that. Um, so your, 
your fresh produce is going to be the core. Then you want to have a cold storage department, which is where you can extend the life of that fresh produce up to weeks and months. And that would be a root cellar or a uh, cool room. I have a cool room and I, I like that. Um, root cellars are better in the, often in the colder climate or cool rooms definitely are better in the colder climates. Um, but they're very easy, very accessible. I love mine. And that extends the life of my fresh produce. Then as you're strolling through the home grocery, uh, you can come to the preserved food department. That's where you would have your dehydrated or dried foods and canned foods. And those are things that you can preserve for, you know, up to 12 months and many times much longer. So that's a longer form of storage of what you have grown that you can eat from year round. And then there's the home bakery department, which I love because it adds so much to your home grocery. Um, if you just think about it, if you only ate the fruits and vegetables or nuts that you had grown and preserved, um, you would get kind of tired of a lot of things. It wouldn't be as filling as a regular meal. But if you have a home bakery, you can make breads and you can make uh, muffins. You can make pancakes. You can make uh, all kinds of incredible things uh, to go with what you have made. So in other words, instead of just sitting down to a table with a, a bowl of apricots that are that you canned and that being your meal, that wouldn't be very fulfilling. But if you could warm up those apricots and maybe thicken them and put them on top of biscuits or toast, and then on top of the toast, you could have some uh, almond butter or pecan butter, whatever type of nuts that you have grown. You can make nut butters and you can put that on your biscuits or your toast and then the apricots on top of that. Now you've got a nice supper or breakfast, either one. And uh, if you can, if you have a home bakery, you can make pizza, you can make a pizza crust and you can top it with your pizza sauce that you made from your garden and canned or fresh if it's summertime. You can put all kinds of veggies on top in the summertime and uh, you can even make a, a really good cheesy sauce from vegetables. Lisa was the one that gave me her recipe for that and I served it a couple of days ago for a meal with guests here and they loved it. It's an incredible way to have that cheesy factor if you don't have a way to have dairy products. So I'm just talking all the possibilities here. It makes your meal so much more interesting. It makes, it extends what the amount of foods that you have put up will go a lot further if you have a home bakery and can add to each meal with those things and make your food more delicious, more interesting, and it'll go a lot further. Yeah. And of course, it, you've also got in the production areas, if you've got chickens, you've got eggs, you know, if you've got goats or cows or whatever, you know, you've got all these other items that can also be produced, the things that people are used to buying that could potentially be produced if that's part of your diet, you can add it, you can produce your own, which is really awesome. Any any areas that we can produce our own is a, is a huge win. Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming that there's some areas where it's either not going to be feasible or practical to produce yourself. Yes, but believe it or not, it's not a real long list if you've carefully planned. Um, I did a cookbook a few years ago, and at the very end of that cookbook, I made a, a list of various items that you might need to purchase depending upon the area you lived in and what you could grow. Um, and it was a quite a short list, but for sure, you would pretty much need to buy different kinds of salts that you used. Uh, salt, baking powder, I don't know any way to make my own baking powder. Uh, I mean, you can combine baking soda and all, but or yeast. You, need, you need to purchase those things. Uh, you can actually make your own yeast. You can mm. use starters and you can, uh, there's various ways you can, you can make your own yeast. It may not be quite as, uh, 
it may not, your bread may not get quite as tall or, or full as with the commercial yeast, but there are ways. But Spices I mean, you would probably need to buy. Uh huh. Oh, I'm sorry. But I guess oh. what I was meaning, this is coming from a total non baker, so ignorant question here. Could you use, since you can do your own yeast, could you use that in place of like the baking soda or baking powder? Oh, oh, oh. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, in certain things, I think, you know, you would learn to make do, but I, w I just have a supply, a nice supply. It's not real expensive. And then, other things that I can think of, um, unless you live in a place where there's rice patties, you might need to buy rice and store it. And the white rice stores quite well. Uh, oils, you would need to buy, but you know what? They can go rancid in a couple years. And so there are, there is a way to make your own oil, believe it or not. Um, in Europe, they came up with the idea of, uh, making something for third world countries where people could use seeds and nuts to make their own oils. And the uh, piece of equipment that you need for that is called the Petiba Press, P-I-T-E-B-A, Petiba Press. And it, it's an expeller press. And I took a class a few years back on how to use that. It was amazing. We put uh, sunflower seeds in the press. The oil just came pouring out. We put pecans in the press. Pecan oil was my favorite. It was delicious. So you can make your own oil, but if you don't have a Petiba press, then then buy some. Uh, as Nick mentioned, the yeast, um, sugars, but you have alternatives. You can uh, ha do beekeeping and have honey. You can very possibly do maple syrup or some other. There's many other trees that you can get syrup from, but it's quite a process. So you may want to store that. Um, if you don't live in places where there are lemon trees, you might want to have some lemon juice on hand because uh, lemon can be used for pickling. It also is used in quite a few recipes uh, for its flavor. Uh, pectin, if you're making uh, jams and jellies. Um, I don't use pectin anymore. I really like to make my jams uh, without pectin. Now, I like the flavor and I like the consistency. However, if you're going for quantity and you want as much jam as you can get from those strawberries that you grew, then you would want to use the pectin. And Pomona pectin is a type of pectin that you can get that doesn't require a certain high amount of sugar. It, uh, it thickens in a different way. And so uh, those are things like that. Um, nuts, oh. the kind of nuts that you don't grow in your area, you might want to purchase in store. Yes. With, with pectin, didn't haven't I uh -huh. heard you talking about ways that you could, if you were in a pinch, make your own pectin? Oh, that's true. I forgot about that right then. Yes, you can make your own pectin from crab apples or green unripe apple. And it is it adds a, a nice touch to to your jam. So there is that aspect, too. Um, grains are another thing like wheat. You, you can grow your own wheat. Uh, it's certainly possible. It would take up space in your garden area. And, uh, most people have found that since, uh, wheat in particular stores incredibly well, you can store wheat for decades, centuries. I mean, King Tut's tomb was opened and there was wheat inside and that wheat sprouted, believe it or not. So, wheat can be stored and many people choose to purchase it because it's rather inexpensive in quantities and store it. Um, beans, the same thing. If you're in an area where beans are iffy as to whether they're going to grow uh, to full to harvest, um, you may want to buy some dried beans and store those too. So those are some things, but there's not a lot uh, that you can't figure out how to grow, preserve, produce, or whatever. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's so cool to think of all the different ways that you could make your own, even for those, some of those items. You know, some of them, if you don't have a salt mine on your property, <laughs> I don't I don't know of any way around that one. But thankfully, right. salt stores really well. In fact, salt <laughs> is used to store other preserve. things, preserve <laughs> other things. So that's, right. that's a good item to to stock up on. Um, but I was also thinking about infrastructure, you know, just like a grocery store has a certain amount of infrastructure 
for its systems in order for things to function properly and and be able to do what it needs to do. Uh, our home grocery is probably going to need some infrastructure too, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. It's an important thing, and that's one of the first things you, you want to do when you start on this uh, ultimate food adventure. You're going to try to figure out uh, what your own infrastructure is going to be. You'll need to decide where on your property you're going to uh, place your garden and your orchard. It needs to be really the, the mo wherever the most fertile soil is, but preferably on a slope. Uh, Elliot Coleman, a, a well-known organic um, farmer and author who lives in Maine, uh, says in one of his books that if you put your garden, uh, if you're in a climate similar to his, which is in Maine, and your garden is sloping five degrees to the south, that's just the same as having a garden on flat land 300 miles further south. So where you place your garden is important. And then you want to improve your soil. You want to get garden tools. You want to fence the garden in. Uh, we learned the hard way that when you don't fence your garden in, uh, the deer and the moose have a rodeo there. And so it's not a, not a very wise idea. Uh, you can learn to even grow your own fertilizer and, uh, you can stock up on other fertilizers. There's several that I think are super good. So, uh, soft rock phosphate is one that we highly recommend because it is so excellent for your plants and it's an organic amendment too. And so your infrastructure will have all that kind of stuff. It'll have the location, the tools and equipment you need, and uh, storage spaces. But an independent water system is a very key part of that infrastructure because if for some reason the grid goes down, for any of the reasons we've talked about um, and many more, then here you've put a lot of work in. You've got a garden going. It's not going to survive or thrive very well without water. And so you need an independent water system. Um, and there are various ways to do that. I'm not going to go into all that detail now, but it needs to be not dependent on public utilities and so that you can keep that garden going. And that's part of the infrastructure that you'll set up. It's not a hard thing to do and it's been done before. So I want to encourage you. This whole experience is actually can be extremely fun rewarding, enjoyable, and a, a, a wonderful way of life. Yeah. And what about kitchen tools? I mean, are, are there any things that you can think of that would be necessary or important for somebody to collect so that they could have their own home grocery? Yes. In fact, these are some things that people can do if they haven't made the move to a country property yet, or if they have, either way. But you can start collecting these tools. Um, of course, canning supplies, uh, a grain mill. If you're going to store your own grain uh, to make it into flour, you'll need a grain mill. A Victorio strainer is a wonderful little piece of uh, equipment, non-electric, and it will help save you hours and hours of time in the kitchen when you're making applesauce, tomato sauce, or uh, seedless jams, that kind of stuff. Um, a pasta maker is something I love. I love to make my own pasta. It's, it's super easy. Just takes a very short, uh, period of time to do it. And, um, a lot of these things, when I have the choice, uh, I'd rather just make it myself than go to the grocery store. It's so much easier. So a pasta maker, a little non-electric Atlas brand is great. A really good blender like a Vitamix is, is invaluable. Um, dehydrators so that you can dehydrate your produce. Excalibur is a very well-known high-end model, but I've used cheaper ones too. And Nick and Lisa, you guys have made your own solar one and it was fabulous. Yeah. Uh, a wood cook stove is one more thing that you would be a nice thing to get uh, to be more independent. A wood stove at the minimum at, with a flat surface can also be used to cook on, but not to bake. And if you want to be able to bake uh, and you don't have a wood cook stove, then uh, cast iron um, pots with lids, like a Dutch oven with a lid, uh, are they're designed where you can put uh, charcoal briquettes or, or hot coals on the top 
and you can actually bake in them. Uh, probably not the easiest thing in the world, but could be a lot of fun. Hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more about the wood cook stove. Such an all-purpose tool. I mean, not only cooking and baking, but it's also heating your house. And you can set it up to heat your hot water. You can dehydrate food over top of it, you know, with hanging racks and stuff. It's just all sorts of amazing things you can do with that with that tool. But yeah, that's an awesome list of of items. And a lot of these are not super expensive. You know, a lot of these are, are relatively small items and they're going to last. You know, it's not not um, disposable stuff, most of this. It's buy it once, and as long as you buy quality, then you've got it, and you can use it for years to come. Any any other thoughts or words of, of wisdom you wanted to speak on, on this topic of home grocery and, and just making your home more prepared from a food standpoint? Well... Yes, because it probably sounds overwhelming to some people. And it's just like anything else. Uh, you take it inch by inch, a day at a time. You start where you can and you go forward. But start and, and don't just read and research about it. Actually do some things. If you're still in a city, get uh, pots, uh, find a place maybe where you can, community garden or something where you can get started or uh, fix the little grow box uh, somewhere near you. Get started, but smart planning. I guess just to kind of summarize all the different things we've sort of been talking about, smart planning is important. Uh, get your own infrastructure going. Figure out where you want to put your garden and orchard on your place once you have a country property. Build up the soil. Get it all ready while, but while you're just getting started. You, that's your ideal time to amend the soil, to get, uh, to ha uh, create a wonderful garden with uh, deep topsoil and things like that. So build up the soil, then learn to grow. That's an experience in itself. Each, each plant is so different and it's just um, a challenge, but a good challenge to learn how to grow each plant. There's things that you'll learn about pollination and fertilizing and things like that. Learn how to preserve what you grow then, because that's uh, an equal, equally interesting thing to do. And there's all kinds of ways. Some are old traditional methods, some are modern methods, but they're wonderful. You can preserve what you grow for year-round eating. Get tools that make it easier. We're really blessed to have all kinds of equipment now that actually can make this much easier than our uh, great grandparents, and then purchase the things that you absolutely cannot grow. And, uh, you know, you have to just kind of estimate those are going to be limited. They're not sustainable. Everything else we've been talking about, uh, is, is quite sustainable, but not the things you purchase. And, but that will round out the stock in your home grocery. Uh, you know, there's challenges of how to store it all and all, but those can all be handled and it's a, an incredible experience and like I said I think it's just the ultimate food experience right and I think the the thing that keeps hitting me is do what you can now you know whatever whatever that might be and so if you're in a situation where you can't grow well like you said mom you can almost anybody can grow in pots grow a few things on a small scale. But if you don't have space to grow on a larger scale, then one thing that you can do is start a food storage program. You know, you can be doing the food planning and the food storage and that side of things where you're placing yourself immediately in a much better position right now where if those grocery shelves are bare, you've still got a good supply of food to carry your family through for a while. And, you know, that's something that, that anybody can do right now is start stocking up a little bit at a time. I know food is expensive. I know you may not be able to go out and just, boom, buy three months of food or six months of food or whatever. But you can start building your supply a little bit at a time and uh, store what you eat, eat what you store, these kinds of things. Those are things that you can do right now and starting to collect this equipment that you were mentioning and 
all of these things, any of these things that, that mom's, mom's been talking about that you can do now, start whittling away at it. And I, I think that's the cure for overwhelm is to to do what you can now and, you know, to uh, do our part, do what we can and leave the rest in God's hands. And one final thought. I'm so glad you mentioned that because, you know, our God is a God of abundance. And when you are out in the soil working and your hands are in the dirt and you're watching those plants come out and then you see when he, when the plant when the season is over and things are going to seed and you're starting to collect your seeds you are am- amazed at the tens of thousands of seeds on lettuce plants and things like that he wants us to have plenty and he wants us to have plenty to share and so like nick says you know do what you can even if it's small and uh i always think of a story in the Bible of the little fellow who went out to see Jesus and there were 5,000 other people that went with him and they were all there by the seaside listening to Jesus and they ended up getting hungry. And as far as we know, there was only one person that had prepared and it was that little boy. He had the five loaves and the two fishes and he was not only prepared, but he was willing to share what little he had. And because of that, well over 5,000 people were fed. Jesus can do the same thing with us. And I've already experienced that happening. Yeah. Well, I heard a little birdie told me that somebody was writing a book on having your own home grocery store. Could you tell us just a little bit about it? (laughs) Well, it's just follows along with what we've been talking about today. Um, I've been really enjoying putting it in book form uh, because I'm the way I'm made up, I sort of, it's very helpful to me to kind of have things laid out in steps. And oh, how do you get started? And what do you do first? And what do you do next? And then what happens after that? And so that's the format. I'm, you know, I've just finished the first draft and I'm working on it, hoping to, to get it done before the end of the year and, and where, where it will be out about the home grocery to just take a person from the point where all of a sudden they've awakened and said, wow, I hadn't even thought about how dependent I was. And then they want to go from there. How do you get started? What would be the first things you would do? And from there. Awesome. Well, we're excited. We can hardly wait until you finish. I've already seen a little excerpts here and there, and it looks really amazing. That's we're excited. Exciting. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. And just a, a quick reminder that if you want to access that food planning calculator that we mentioned earlier, you can get that by going to thereadylife.com forward slash food planner. That's all lowercase, no spaces or anything, just thereadylife.com forward slash food planner. And our podcast episode that discusses that whole thing and will give you more detail on on the, the whole system of food planning, you can find that at episode number five. So you can either navigate there wherever you're listening to this, or you can go to thereadylife.com forward slash five, the number five and that will get you to that episode. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Bye now.